Welcome to the Health Workforce Technical Assistance Center's webinar series. This webinar is entitled, The Massachusetts Delivery System Reform Incentive Payment Program, Supporting the Transition to Accountable Care Organizations. And it was presented by Tara Murphy, Eliza Norcross, and Haley Toser on February 12, 2019. Hello, my name is David Armstrong, and today's webinar focuses on Massachusetts' DITSWIP program. After the presentation, you may ask questions using the chat panel on your screen. Also, when the event ends, you'll be directed to a short evaluation survey. So please take a few moments to provide us with your feedback. With that said, I'm going to go ahead and turn the event over to our presenters. Great, David. Thank you. We're really delighted to be part of your technical assistance webinar series. So again, my name is Tara Murphy. I'm here with my colleagues, Eliza, Eliza Norcross and Helly Tosher, and we are part of um, the MassHealth team. Um, MassHealth is what we call Medicaid here in Massachusetts. We want to spend most of our time with you today telling you about some of the investments that we're making in the healthcare workforce in Massachusetts. But before we, we jump into that, I wanted to take just a few minutes to give you a sense of the broader context which, within which we're thinking about um, the healthcare workforce across the state. So a couple of things, so we're, we're on a slide right now that um, talks about the entitled district funding overview. A couple of things are pretty important to know um, when you think about what's happening here with the healthcare workforce in Massachusetts. The first is that we're in the early stages of an incredibly ambitious undertaking in which we are restructuring the way in which um, Medicaid services are delivered and paid for. The, the crux of that is that we are reorganizing the vast majority of our Medicaid providers across the state into Medicaid or MassHealth accountable care organizations that will ultimately be responsible for the total cost of care the health outcomes and the member experience of an established um, population of mass health members. Right now we have um, 17 separate um, mass health ACOs that we're working with. We are also um, creating something or have created something that we call community partners here in Massachusetts. So that's a capital C, a capital P. And these are organizations or collections of organizations with expertise in um, meeting the needs of mass health members with serious behavioral health issues and or with long-term service and support needs. So members who are potentially the highest cost, most complex and, and highest risk um, members to care for. These community partners, you can think of them as roughly equivalent to health homes. Um, these community partners will contract or are contracting with the ACOs um, to take on care management and care coordination for these um, set populations of mass health members, again, with significant BH needs or long-term service and support needs. So that, that's kind of the big picture of what's happening with the Massachusetts Medicaid program right now. Um, the way we're funding much of this is through something called um, the district program. So my hunch is that many of you on um, the call will be familiar with um, DISRIP. It stands for Delivery System Reform Incentive Program, and it's essentially a funding program that is managed by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, so at the federal level, and um, provides, provides a source of um, funding support for innovation in Medicaid programs across the nation. Not every state taps into the DISRIP program, um, but it, it's implemented in not just Massachusetts, um, many different states across the country, and um, each state sort of taps into this or uses this district funding in a, in a unique way, in a different way. Here in Massachusetts, um, we have $1.8 billion of district funding over five years, so it runs from 2017 to 2022. And we are using it primarily, we're pulling solely to support um, this Medicaid um, payment and care delivery innovation um, that really hinges on this reorganization into ACOs and CPs that we've, we've talked about. So if you look at this slide, um, the vast majority of our district funding is going to support ACOs or community partners. There is a little bit um, that we are using to run the district program itself. 
And then where we want to focus most of this webinar is on statewide investments. Um, that's 6% of the overall district funding, $115 million over five years. And we are using statewide investments you can think of as a portfolio of um, individual eight separate funding streams that we are using in the state to either build and strengthen the healthcare workforce across Massachusetts um, and or build and strengthen the healthcare delivery infrastructure throughout Massachusetts. You can think of statewide investments as um, really funding that will be used to create the conditions statewide in which ACOs and CPs are more likely to succeed. So if we go to the next slide, um, you can see a broad overview of the statewide investments portfolio. Basically, we're working in three big areas. The first is building and training the primary care and behavioral health workforce. The second is really looking at capacity building for those ACOs and CPs that we talked about, um, as well as for the individual provider organizations um, within those ACOs and CPs and then a couple of initiatives to address statewide gaps in care delivery. We really, as we talked about, um, as I mentioned earlier, we really want to focus in, um, in this webinar on um, giving you a sense of what we're doing related to the healthcare workforce in Massachusetts. And we'll, we'll talk about two of our four funding streams for healthcare workforce, in particular, student loan repayment program and workforce development grant program. In the interest of time, um, we will move directly onto those programs, but I wanted to, um, it's not here on the slide, but wanted to let you know that you can learn more about statewide investments on um, the mass.gov website. Um, I think the easiest way to get to a more detailed um, description of these programs is, is really just to Google Mass Health statewide investments, and that should bring you directly to the page. So right now, I'll um, turn the next phase over, next slide over to Eliza Norcross, who will talk a little bit about the investments that we're making in community health workers. Thank you, Tara. As Tara mentioned, one of the ways in which we're supporting the Massachusetts workforce is through statewide investment number four, the Workforce Development Grant Program. There are a few different investments within this work stream, but I'm going to really focus in on our efforts to support community health workers. So we decided to dedicate a portion of the statewide investments to CHWs due to the guiding principles for program design that we established pretty early on in the program design phase. One of our top priorities was to focus on areas with high anticipated need by ACOs and CPs, and we wanted to do this by increasing the availability of well-prepared healthcare workers across the state beyond primary care providers nurse practitioners, and other provider types that we're focusing on through other mechanisms. Additionally, we wanted to make sure that any investment really supported ongoing efforts to reinforce quality and standardization for the frontline and extended healthcare workforce. Finally, another key consideration was really advancing the career prospects of frontline workers with a focus on the incumbent workforce. So all of these considerations really led us straight to community health workers for a couple of reasons. We know that community health workers are really critical members of high-functioning complex care management teams, which are really at the heart of mass health restructuring efforts. We were also hearing a lot from ACOs and CPs about their expected influx of CHW hiring. And at the same time, we knew from partner organizations across the state that there were substantial reported wait lists at existing CHW core competency training programs really across the state. Additionally, Massachusetts has been working for the past few years to enhance the professionalization of the CHW field through legislation and subsequent efforts. Through the Department of Public Health, CHWs can now obtain voluntary certification and and CHW core competency training programs can be approved to offer core competency certification training. All of these factors led us to dedicate a portion of statewide investment funding to CHWs, and we've done so through three distinct programs. The first one, um, the CHW Training Capacity Expansion Grants. Through this program, we're supporting a handful of existing CHW core competency training programs to expand their capacity for training CHWs by funding an additional 200 slots across the state over the next year. 
We're hoping that this investment lessens or even eliminates the training program wait lists and this allows for CHWs from ACOs and CPs to attend core competency training. The CHW Supervisor Training Incentive Fund awarded one organization to both design a training curriculum for supervisors of CHWs and then implement that training to a cohort of about 60 CHW supervisors. Through our exploratory conversations about CHWs, it has become pretty clear that strong supervision plays a really significant role in CHW retention, but that there wasn't a standardized training curriculum available in the state. For both of these programs, MassHealth is working with Commonwealth Corporation, which is a quasi-state agency through the Executive Office of Labor and Workforce Development. And we're also collaborating really closely with our sister agency, the Department of Public Health, as well as partner organizations, including the Massachusetts Association for Community Health Workers. The third major way in which we're investing in CHWs is through statewide investment number five, which is our technical assistance program. We've teamed up with APT Associates, Health Resources in Action, um, the Massachusetts Association for Community Health Workers, the Transformation Center, as well as Harvard Medical School Center for Primary Care to design and implement learning communities for CHWs as well as peer specialists. Each of the learning communities will have cohorts of about 35 individuals and the two cohorts will come together for a portion of the collaborative. The main goals for this effort are to provide CHWs and peer specialists with professional development opportunities and to foster peer learning networks, which we hope will be an ongoing source of support once these workers return to their practices and everyday roles. Um, I will now pass things over to Hallie to speak about some of our other workforce investments. Great, thank you, Eliza. So in addition to the programs that Eliza just mentioned, we have a suite of programs that are focused on the community-based workforce. We decided to invest in the community-based in community organizations because of their recognized value to Medicaid members. Specifically, community health centers and community-based behavioral health organizations are really uniquely equipped to support individuals with complex health, social, and behavioral health needs. They also provide culturally competent care in multiple languages and play a key role in fulfilling that health restructuring goals by better integrating public health, health-related social needs, and behavioral health, and addressing those needs in a holistic way. Specifically in Massachusetts, 40 approximately 40% of MassHealth members are served in community health centers. And a significant portion of members rely on behavioral health services in community-based behavioral health settings. However, the majority of uh, these organizations face workforce challenges, specifically with recruitment and retention. For example, a large portion of all clinical positions are vacant in health centers nationwide, mostly for family physicians and nurse practitioners. Vacancies are also an issue with behavioral health organizations, particularly for psychiatrists and advanced practice prescribing nurses. Community-based organizations usually struggle to offer competitive salaries, which can lead to issues with recruitment as well. And in addition to offering lower pay, often these organizations may struggle to retain clinicians who can often get burned out due to working with individuals with very complex needs and in often um, under-resourced and impoverished areas. So the statewide investments um, have decided to focus on addressing some of these workforce challenges. I'll talk about one of those programs today, which is the Student Loan Repayment Program. So we're working to implement this program with the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers in close collaboration with the Association for Behavioral Health Care. So this program repays a portion of the student loan obligations of providers who are selected through a competitive process in exchange for their four-year commitment to practice in a community setting. The program is really targeted toward providers early on in their careers to help with retention. This table here you can see is a list of the eligible providers, which includes physicians, nurses, and a host of licensed behavioral health providers. The year one application cycle for this program has concluded, and we are happy to see we received 122 applications 
and selected 70 providers um, within this program. And as you can see, the majority of applications we received came from licensed behavioral health providers. And due to a significant need for both licensed and unlicensed behavioral health providers in community-based behavioral health settings, we decided to invest a program specifically for those providers in those settings. So we have a behavioral health workforce development program, which looks similar to the student loan repayment program, but was really just focused on licensed and unlicensed behavioral health providers in community-based behavioral health settings. And we selected 43 different individuals for that program. To further help with retention, um, these providers will get an opportunity to attend learning days once a quarter that allows them to step away from their clinical work and really focus on self-care, empowerment, professional development, and ways to work in a new accountable care environment. I'll now turn it over to Tara to go over some of the evaluation um, criteria that we have. So in, in terms of evaluation, we've got um, another, a, a number of um, vehicles that we're using. So when, if we think about, um, go back and, and leave statewide investments to one side for a moment, and we think about the overall DISER program, um, we're looking at that in two ways. The first is through an independent evaluator who will um, evaluate the extent to which um, the district program overall, so remember that's the funding for ACOs, for community partners, and for statewide investments, um, the extent to which the district program overall has achieved its stated goals. We've contracted with um, the University of Massachusetts Medical School um, to implement that overall evaluation. Um, we're also looking at, um, it, it, so we've engaged an independent assessor who will be kind of keeping an eye on the district program again overall with the goal of looking, um, kind of coming up with a, a midpoint assessment of how on or off track, hopefully on track we are towards implementing the overall district program and, and meeting those broader goals. We're working with the public consulting group, another um, outside group, um, to conduct the independent assessment or kind of midpoint assessment of the district program overall. Um, in terms of those statewide investments, so the two, the, the, the handful that uh, Eliza and Hallie just went over with you, as well as the eight investment streams overall, we really have a bunch of process metrics that we've put in place for each of the individual programs um, to see how well we're, we're hitting the mark and to inform um, programming for the, for the next upcoming year. So a quick example of that is, is taking a look at the student loan repayment program that Hallie just described to you. In the second year, um, we increased, because we received so many applications for um, licensed behavioral health provider uh, student loan repayment in year one, um, we significantly, significantly increased the number of uh, loan repayment slots for licensed behavioral health care providers that we were offering in year two. We're also looking at um, program-specific impact metrics, so um, really doing things like satisfaction surveys, um, kind of pre- and post-surveys for, for different programs as, as we go along, um, again, to get a sense of not just the demand for the different programs, but how closely they're hitting the mark. I think that, that concludes our formal presentation, um, and we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right, thank you. Well, that was very informative. I, I, I always find it interesting to see what different states are, are doing. With that said, we do have a few questions lined up, and so I'm just going to start running through them. And once more, a reminder to our audience, you may ask questions using the chat panel on your screen. First question, how are ACOs using community health workers? Thanks, David. Um, I think for the most part, uh, ACOs are really trying to integrate community health workers into their care management teams. Um, in some cases, the provider practices and health systems were already either using CHWs or um, kind of had similar um, staff taking on similar roles. In other cases, it's a really um, the care teams themselves are a really new formulation, really focused on member outcomes, and so the integration of the CHWs is a really critical piece to them being able to deliver high-quality care um, and requires a lot of strategic thought on the part of practice leaders as well as ACO 
leadership to really integrate those roles into existing workflows. Okay, thank you. And really kind of a follow-up question, why did you decide to focus on community health workers for the learning communities? Thanks. Um, another good question. I think one of the things we heard when we were doing um, a lot of the program design over the past year and year and a half was that there's a lot, um, a lot kind of resting on the shoulders of CHWs um, in terms of them being seen as a as a healthcare worker that can really kind of bridge the gap between um, between the practice and the community, and I think they can certainly do that and um, have been shown to really provide a lot of value to members they're serving and to play a really important role in um, moving to value-based care, but that in some cases there's a lot of many unknowns around um, how to best leverage community health workers, how to best supervise them, how to best support them, um, and I think a lot increasingly around kind of how they can come together as a workforce in and of themselves. And so the learning community was really a way for us to provide a kind of a space for CHW to come together, um, talk about kind of how they see their role in the practices um, and kind of provide that shared learning um, and peer support structure for them in an ongoing basis. Okay, and actually here's an interesting question. Is there any cross-learning on workforce investments happening between different states, across states, and what other states besides Massachusetts and New York are doing workforce in their district programs? Um, so I can talk a little bit about um, the learning. We've, we've sort of had our, our um, nose to the grindstone but we've, uh, for the past 18 months, um, but we've been able to participate in some great shared learning with, with New York State District in particular. Um, we, were able, we were fortunate enough to, end, um, to, to be able to participate in the 2018 district, New York State District Learning Symposium and made some great connections, particularly, particularly around workforce. Um, with some of the, um, I think New York State is using their district funding to, to support performing provider systems, um, uh, um, the different collections of um, healthcare organizations across New York, and have been able to create some great connections with, with some of the different performing provider systems, especially around workforce, so there's the, the all going back and forth there. In, in terms of um, more broadly across the United States, um, we've, you know, we, we keep an eye on the different initiatives that are happening. I haven't had the same chance to go in depth. We also, as I think both Eliza and Hallie were saying, um, we work with a lot of partner um, organizations here in Massachusetts. And we know, for example, if we go back to community health workers, um, our Department of Public Health Office of Community Health Workers is, is viewed as a national leader um, in um, the community health worker workforce, and we have really engaged quite heavily with them and, and leaned on their expertise. Um, I think we have, um, we have our Gary Singh with us, who joined us midway through, who is the director of the district program um, here in Massachusetts. He might be able to talk about how many states that district is actually active in. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's a good question. Um, so I don't have the I don't have names of states off the top of my head right now, but there are a number of briefs that various organizations have put out about district program landscape. Um, so Mathematica, I think, is one of them. Uh, there's one other which is sort of uh, slipping my mind right now. But if you search for district um, state survey or national landscape, um, you'll be able to find some of those briefs and. Um, and I know that some of those briefs, uh, there is information um, that is included about what, uh, what states are doing specifically around workforce development. And I can say also that we were very excited when we were in New York that there, was, um, there had been so much investment across New York State in community health workers using deserve dollars, um, and I believe also um, the recovery professionals. And um, so that's, if you're thinking about kind of frontline workforce in particular, I think that would be a great, a great place to look. All right, thank you. Here's your next question. 
how many clinicians, therapists, community health workers, providers essentially, will you have trained or located during the program period? And how will they be sustained after the end of DISRIP? Yep. Um, so I can take the first part of that question, um, assuming you mean over the five years of the district and of the district yes. program. And, and um, <laughs> um, the the answer to that is really um, to be determined. So we've been, as we talked about a little bit, we've been um, kind of really making sure we've we set up our our workforce investments so that we really evaluate the demand and the effectiveness effectiveness of them from year to year. Um, and so we will, as we go forward from year one to year two to year three and so on, we'll really course correct for the number of slots that we make available in each subsequent year based on the demand that we saw in the previous year and then any sort of um, external factors that we uh, become aware of. Um, so. As you can imagine, we're really working on a, a very dynamic canvas here. Um, the ACOs and the CPs are really, you know, off the ground, but really works in progress and, and sort of changing from year to year. Um, and um, we, we want to make sure that we're responsive to what's happening in those ACOs and CPs, as, as well as to the, to, um, the demand that we're picking up on as we actually um, implement our programs. Yeah, and uh, just to add a couple of other um, thoughts. So one of them is, as Tara mentioned, the, a significant portion of the funding going to ACOs, uh, or, uh, it is going to ACOs, and um, I believe in uh, calendar year 18 and 19, roughly between 50 to 60% of those dollars have gone to care coordination uh, types of investments, uh, and uh, many of those types of investments actually are to hire CHWs, uh, care coordinators, um, et cetera. So I don't have a concrete number there, but uh, 50 to 60% of hundreds of millions of dollars is, um, is quite an investment uh, in care coordination. In terms of that second part, which is how, how will this be sustainable? So really the intent of the district program is to serve as, is to serve as a one-time upfront investment to really get the ball rolling and to provide that, that startup funding that ACOs will need to, uh, to start making the shift away from fee-for-service to uh, value-based care. Um, and so the idea is that, um, is that ACOs will eventually, uh, once they've you know, transitioned to this value-based care uh, financial model, uh, they'll be able to leverage some of the shared savings that they accrue from, uh, from you know, performing well in total cost of care accountability and use those, uh, use those dollars to continue funding some of these uh, positions, which previously wouldn't have been able to be supported in, in a standard fee-for-service uh, payment model. Now, obviously, there will be situations where ACOs don't have, uh, don't have um, shared savings. There will be shared losses. And so it really will become uh, one of those budget prioritization questions for ACOs to think through. Uh, but really, the, the intent is that hiring these care coordination staff, hiring uh, uh, CHWs, care specialists, um, and the, the broad sort of population health management strategy will lead to cost savings in the long run. And so even if you see short-term losses, eventually the, the, the hope would be uh, that these upfront investments will, uh, will lead to uh, cost savings down the road. And in terms of um, sustaining some of the things like, that we've talked about, like learning communities or student learner payment, or um, even the, the additional core competency training slots for, for community health workers, um, where again, this is, um, we, we come to the end in, in 2022, so we anticipate that the landscape will look very different at that point um, than it does now. But we are also partnering, as we talked about, um, partnering very closely with lots of different groups um, in the, as they say, the, the healthcare ecosystem here in Massachusetts. So groups like the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers, um, Massachusetts Association of Community Health Workers, so on and so forth. And so we're, um, as part of our ongoing conversation with those groups are um, if, we've, if we've put something in place that we think is very, very valuable, it might fall outside the ACOs or the CPs, how can we keep that up and running once the statewide investment portion of the district dollars is, is gone? 
Okay, thank you. Uh, we've actually reached the end of our scheduled broadcast. With that said, I do have a few more questions here. Uh, do you by chance have time to stay on for a few more minutes? Um, we can certainly do that, absolutely. Okay, that's wonderful. And for those of you in the audience who need to take off, we are recording this event. And so if you need to go, you can catch the end of the QA in the future on our website at healthworkforcemta.org. Um, first of all, thanks for the great presentation. I'm interested in learning more about your investments in community-based training and recruitment. Is there anything you can say quickly about this? So we took a deeper dive um, in the formal presentation into this, in our workforce investments. We took a deeper dive into student loan repayment program and then the community health worker portion of our um, workforce development grant program. Um, it sounds like you might be asking about investment number three, investments in community-based training and recruitment, which is sort of a, another, another investment stream. Is, is, that, is that correct? Yes, I believe the question is directed towards that, and I believe they're interested in GME specifically, but broader also. Sure. Um, so, so GME is um, not something that we've really addressed um, specifically in any or in sort of a dedicated manner in any of our statewide investments. That said, um, the learning day component of the student loan repayment program does offer GME credits for the student loan repayment um, uh, recipients who are participating in those learning days. When we're looking at the investments in the community-based training and recruitment, that's really um, two separate, uh, two to three separate programs that are um, rolled up into that. The first is looking at increasing the opportunities for residency training in community health centers. Um, as a mechanism of really, um, number one, better preparing young physicians and nurse practitioners to, um, to address, uh, to, to work in a community health center-based environment. So again, these are resource, typically, typically resource-limited environments that care for very, very complex um, patients. Um, so we've, um, the residency um, arm, the residency um, arm of the, investments in community-based training and recruitment really funds additional training slots in community health centers for both family medicine physicians and for um, nurse practitioners. Um, because the residency structure for nurse practitioners versus um, family medicine physicians is, is very different, we actually run that, that arm of the investment as two separate programs. So, um, so that, that's, that's one piece of that investment number three that is actually broken into to two pieces, one for nurse practitioners and one for family physicians. The other um, component of investments in community-based training and recruitment really focuses in on community-based behavioral health providers, which often have recruitment challenges. Um, and so what we've, what we've done there is, is basically offer um, recruitment packages to community-based behavioral health providers to incentivize um, number one, psychiatrists, and number two, nurse practitioners with prescribing privileges to take on roles in community-based behavioral health provider organizations. So those incentive packages are comprised of student loan payment, um, as well as two years of special project funding um, that will, will sort of enable um, the newly recruited psychiatrist or, or nurse practitioner with prescribing privileges to take on some more professional development um, and, and professional growth. And those recruitment packages come with four-year strings um, that tie the newly recruited psychiatrist or nurse practitioner to the community-based um, BH provider organization for four years. So that's a that's okay. a very high level answer to a to a, um, a fairly complicated investment stream. No, no, no I, I think that yeah. works out well, and I think that someone may be reaching out to you shortly, <laughs> just okay. to give you a heads up. I'm, I'm going to do the, the plug again for our, our website on mass.gov. Um, just Google um, Mass Health 
statewide investments, and we'll take you to a series of pages that goes into um, far more details um, about each of these investment streams. Okay, that's good. And if you and maybe we can kind of if you can loop back around to Morgan and myself, and if there's any other resources you want us to put on our website about what you're doing, we'll be more than happy to. That said, I do have one more question, and then we should probably go ahead and wrap up. Are you tracking the additional workforce needs that develop from your larger district program? For example, um, the New York district has reported on health workforce hiring that resulted from their district. Yeah, um, so we are, um, so that's a good question, and um, it, it's actually a, a tricky question. Um, we are certainly, um, um, I don't think we have an official reporting mechanism set up, but this is something that we are um, have set up internal questions that we ask our ACOs and CPs from, from year to year. So we actually have in their reporting um, and budget requests that they do to us, um, us being the broader district program on, on an annual basis. We have a subset of questions um, embedded in there that, that actually ask them who they are, who are they planning to hire with their district dollars and how they're planning to train them and, 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 and integrate them into um, their different healthcare providers and, and care teams and so on. So the answer is yes. Um, we also track that through the budget request. The, answer, the, the broad answer is yes. Um, I don't know that we have the level of formal reporting that it sounds to me like New York State has put in place. And that's, that's me not being an expert on New York State's district program as well. Okay, thank you. Well, I think we should probably go ahead and wrap up. Uh, once more, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, um, thank you, Tara, Elisa, Hallie, and also Gary for dropping by. And thank you in the audience for attending our event. We hope to see you all again in the future. With that said, uh, I hope everyone has a good afternoon. Take care. David, thank you. Just to let you know, we will be posting our slides shortly to our website. So if you want to download them, check back very quickly at healthworkforcet.org.